to say my understanding of my own sexuality is complicated is an understatement. The conversations with myself in my head before I fall asleep at night usually go something like this. Am I a whore? Yeah, probably. Do I care that I'm probably a whore? Literally not at all. Do other people think that I'm a whore? Most definitely. Do, do I care that they think that? <laughs> not really. <laughs> but I mean, kind of. So let's back up a bit, because you don't even know me yet. Why might one describe me in this way? Well, for starters, my body count did go up by about four since the start of the pandemic, which isn't the safest behavior I know. I use dating apps, even when I'm regularly having sex, just because I like to keep a rotation on deck. I am pretty open about my sex life, which some may interpret as raunchiness. I will have sex with people I just met and people I know I will never see again. I've even sold nude pictures when I needed or wanted the cash. There is an instance in which I cannot for the life of me remember the name of the man that has indeed been inside of me. So yeah, I'm perfectly okay with being labeled as promiscuous. That being said, when I was 11 reading Cosmopolitan and planning my adult life, I thought it would be totally okay to be a little slutty in college. Yes, fifth grade me did plan on sexual liberation as a form of owning my femininity. What I didn't expect was the quiet judgment that I would face once I got into a place in which I finally feel like I have complete ownership over my sexuality. Like I said earlier, my feelings about my sex life can be confusing at times. For one, I was labeled a whore well before I actually ever became one. This is mostly due to the fact that my chest is sort of really big. My boobs are disproportionately large for my body, and I have always struggled with finding clothes that aren't too revealing. A long time ago, I gave up on trying to dress in a way that hid my figure and started to wear what I felt most comfortable in, which sometimes means my cleavage is out, okay? A friend of a friend took this as evidence of promiscuity when I was 15 and swiped up on a picture on Fred, said friend's story of me in a tank top to ask, who's that girl? She looks like a whore. I had barely had my first kiss. Cat callers on the street make similar judgments. Put them titties away, baby, or I might have to do something about it. I realized a while back that if people are going to make assumptions about my sexual history, just based on a factor of my appearance that I have no control over. Unless one of you wants to lend me $12,000 for a reduction, then I might as well do whatever the hell I want. But sometimes I think back to a time when I wasn't so quick to sleep with strange men. <laughs> the experience is disturbingly common senior year trip gone wrong. It was the last night of my vacation with friends to Mexico, and I found myself at an open air bar at the same time as the boy who had been eyeing me all week, despite my repeated polite refusals. Determined to make my last night a good one, I let a few hours go by and the music seemed to soften and the voices got louder and the stars brighter, and I knew I was drunk. My friend and I ended up in the back of the car of some boys that we knew, including the one who would assault me. And they drove us back to the house we were staying at. And 
as I stepped out, the boy who had wanted me so badly grabbed me and pushed me against the wall and began kissing me. And I guess I liked it enough. We moved inside and he tried to rape me. I stared at the ceiling thinking, I put myself in this situation. I told myself it was my shitty Spanish, that we were both just lost in translation. But I know that's not true. Because damn it, I was good at Spanish. And because no is universal. I gave him head as he pinned me down in hopes that if I could just get him to come, then he would stop trying to force himself inside of me. Eventually, I managed to grab his arms and shove him off me. He called me a name and finally left. And I cried. I remember feeling so cold. So, yeah. I think there is a chance that I have a lot of sex with a lot of different people because I'm trying to reclaim some part of myself. And I, I understand that's not necessarily the healthiest way to cope with trauma, but please, save the lecture. Because as a sexual assault survivor, there is something really fucking empowering in having the choice to say yes. And sometimes, promiscuity feels great. I am comfortable enough in myself and my sexuality to know my boundaries and not feel shame in the desire to feel pleasure. And I am confident enough in myself to know that having sex does not degrade my value as a person. I know shit. <laughs> I can honestly say that this is the most content and the most secure that I have ever felt. And I'm not saying you need sex to be happy, but I do know when young baby Tate said, I do what I want to do and I am who I want to be, she was really onto something. The world, correction, the patriarchy, decided who I would be long before I ever had the chance to decide for myself. If my body is going to be under constant threat of hypersexualization and exploitation, then I choose to take ownership over my own sexuality. The feeling of having complete control over my body and my choices is a pretty awesome feeling. And I can honestly say that I have never felt more like I am who I want to be. We all know, Samantha was the best character in Sex in the City anyways. <laughs> <laughs>